Well, I could turn this into a video making fun of everybody who suddenly lost a lot of money in cryptocurrency within the past week. I think it was so funny that even while I was poking fun at the rallies that pushed Bitcoin back to like 31,000, I think for even a, a, a short time, it saw 32,000. I was basically laughing because I was like, you know what? This is going to be a rug pull and anybody who's stupid enough to buy this dip is going to lose their money. So now here you have Bitcoin at 26,260. Now you have Ethereum at 1,385. And it was funny because I was reading this morning that Ethereum had just dropped to $1,500. And now you're dropping to 1,387. Litecoin, still a joke. It was $50 the last time I looked at it. And that was probably a couple of hours ago. Dudes who I argue with at work about VeChain and how, you know, wonderful VeChain is. I, I, you know, it's funny. Some of these people can explain to you all of these technical details and stuff about this VeChain. Well, I think the hardest thing he's going to have to explain to me when I see him tomorrow is why the shit suddenly lost so much money and why it's down to uh, two cents. And by the way, he was investing heavily when VeChain was basically more than it is now. So, you know, the people who were anxious to see XRP, oh yeah, XRP is going to win their case. SEC ain't got nothing on their time. Well, um, from what I heard, uh, the government asked for a continuance. I believe they're supposed to get witnesses to testify against XRP. And uh, considering XRP is uh, Ripple, otherwise known as XRP, considering it's like 34 cents right now, down from where it was like, I think about a couple of months ago, it was like a dollar. And it's it's so down. And it was funny because there were people who kept on putting money into this shit. And I kept telling them, I kept saying, listen, if XRP is in the government scrutiny for whatever reason, chances are they're not going to lose this case. And even if they do, you're going to lose so much money up until they do lose the case, until it's not even going to be worth it. And then there's Cardano. I remember people going off at $3. Oh, yeah, yeah, look, I got my Cardano, Cardano, $3. Look at how my Cardano, oh, my God, look at the Cardano. Well, you know, uh, Cardano's down to 47 cents. I mean, fuck. I, I, for, for each one of your Cardanos, I can park my car for like 25 minutes in a New York City parking meter at this point. Like, that's a damn shame. And, of course, the Shiba Inu. I was looking at, there was one story on Yahoo, and it was actually negative. They actually were saying, oh, could Shiba Inu drop to zero dollars? Now, technically, I don't know if they know this, but Shiba Inu is zero dollars. Um, you know, it's it's not worth a dollar it's not worth a penny it's actually worth what is it point zero 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 eight three one which is an infinitesimal amount and everybody was applauding shiba inu oh yeah look it went up like 10 million percent in like five days and yeah that was called a pump and dump and and now you've watched the dump and then there's dodge coin dodge coin couldn't even get to a dollar you got elon musk with his stupid dodge day and going on Saturday Night Live, and <laughs> I tried telling people, I tried telling them, I tried, I did my best. But the reason why I'm making this video really is not just to bash cryptocurrency and the people who didn't listen to me when I told them to put their money in oil and energy and lithium mining and electric vehicles. No, the reason why I'm making this video is actually to talk a little bit real quickly about one of the articles that I read that had to do with how you should invest in stocks. Because, and I tell you, one of the things that bothers me is nowadays, like when I got people who know how well I do in the stock market personally, and they're like, oh yeah, I want you to help me do my portfolio. And I'm like, you should have started doing this like years ago, you know, especially back in March 2020 when you saw that there was a major crash. That's when you were supposed to buy in. And then the question is, okay, well, what do you buy? 
And the problem is a lot of people, they during the crash, they started buying popular uh, stocks. They started buying growth popular stocks. They were buying things that everybody was really excited about. Cryptocurrency was one of them because, as you know, these fake-ass gurus on MSNBC, CNBC, Fox Business, YouTube paid sponsorships, all of these fakes were out there pushing you to invest in this shit. And ultimately, you may have gotten suckered into these highly hyped up value and growth stocks that were basically only growing because of COVID. And now you got basically the rug pulled out from under you. So that's really what I want to talk about. I wanted to talk about this article real quick. So as far as this crypto shit, let me tell you something. If this entire market right now, because basically I, I had posted, I think uh, the whole crypto market was like $1.14 trillion. Considering what's happening tonight and what may continue into this week, the crypto market may go below a trillion dollars. And some people just don't understand why that's happening, but I've been telling you why it's happening. People who have invested, or I, I hate to use the word invest, but people who gamble in this shit are pulling their money out. They're stripped to the bone by Biden gas prices and energy in general, because it's not just gas that's high, it's also energy in general, especially when you add food. Grocery prices have increased. So basically what you're watching is you're watching this entire market basically getting killed by the fact that people are being forced to spend all their money on food and energy. So considering that the government has no more of those stimulus welfare checks to print out to hand you, and considering the government is not in any position, I don't care what you hear Biden and Harris say, the government right now is in no position to pay off student loans at all. Now, they did forgive, I think it was like close to $6 billion from some school that actually was basically fraudulent and went under. But the problem with them doing even that, and all, although I think you know that's a little bit more forgivable, but the problem is it's still a moral hazard because what it tells these other schools that may be fraudulent school systems is that if they run up the debt, that the taxpayer will just end up on the hook for it and they get away scot-free. My question is this. It's like all those people who are part of these, uh, these fraudulent schools, why aren't those people in jail right now? If the taxpayer had to spend close to $6 billion to, to, to pay back defrauded students, then why aren't those people in jail? This government is in no shape to send out welfare checks. This government is in no shape for bailouts. This government is in no shape for student loans. Now, you can be stupid and you can let Biden and Harris try to convince you that all you got to do is vote Democrat this year in November when they're going to get their asses handed to them. But if you let them convince you that all you got to do is vote Democrat and that, uh, oh, yeah, you know, while Biden's in his second term, uh, he'll be able to give you the student loan. No, no, no. it's not going to happen. This government is already showing you that they're raising interest rates and they may end up getting to a point where they have to stop raising interest rates because they may not even be able to pay for the national debt. But one thing I can promise you is if there is another recession like in 2008, if there is another bubble burst that happens because of what we're seeing is as far as the inflation rising and the unemployment numbers rising, what I can promise you is that this time there's not going to be a bailout. The government has, they, they've been, you know what they have, they've done? They've taken all of their credit cards and they've maxed them all out. And at this point, there's, you know, you've made enemies with everybody who could have possibly helped you buy the debt. Even China's getting pissed off at America. China's claiming they're about to take over Taiwan. Russia's already curb stomping Ukraine. And even, uh, what is it? I believe, uh, uh, we, we've got a problem where India and Syria and Pakistan may end up having an issue. You also got Turkey. Turkey may be about to invade Syria. So now you've got you've got a serious situation on your hands. And the one thing I can promise you is that this government is in no shape to bail anybody out. So don't let these 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 Democrat liars don't let them try to convince you not to fire them in November simply because you think you're going to get a check. 
That $10,000 that they promised, I don't even think that's happening. The average student loan buyer has over $40,000 worth of student loans. That's partially because if they've gone out of state and they've stayed in any of these out-of-state schools and stayed on campus for even one semester, they've run up between thirty dollars and $40,000 worth of student debt in just that one year. $10,000 is not going to do much of anything. Not to mention whatever the government hand giveth, the other hand taketh away. So that means that, yeah, they can give you $10,000 if possible, but you're going to end up paying for it with more inflation. So don't let yourselves be fooled. This whole market is a big-ass rug pull, and you've just had the, sh the wool pulled over your eyes, and you had the rug pulled from beneath. So today's article comes from Market Watch. First of all, let me just say something about Market Watch. These people who write for Market Watch, they put out, I'll say, thought-provoking articles, but they're ve they're really not very good at making future calls. Like, for example, I haven't deleted any of my videos. If you go into my Market Watch profile and you look at all my videos, I've made predictions that have come true. I told you about weed stocks years ago before Trump even got into office. And sure enough, I told you that when Biden and Harris got into office, it was going to be good for weed stocks. There was a, 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 a rapid rise in weed stocks because they basically legalized marijuana. And then weed stocks basically flattened out into nothing because for the most part, they were all penny stocks. I made my money off of those weed stocks. I sold out a bunch of positions. And then I just backed away. Then I told you March 2020, oil. Oil went negative. Now, seeing oil go negative, I was like, holy shit, let me get as much money as I can and pile into oil. Because I knew there was no way oil was going to stay negative. Anybody who had a brain saw that right away. They piled into oil stock. And sure enough, my oil stocks have gone up several thousands of percents. Because, as you see, gas prices right now are unbearable. In California, some people in many places are actually seeing $7 a gallon gas as a norm. Here in New York, even with them canceling the gas tax holiday, even with them dipping into the Strategic Petroleum Reserve, gas is still $5.28. The only reason why the government doesn't allow it to get any higher or is doing the basics that they can do to try to stop it is because they know that if it gets too high, um, you know, they can have serious civil unrest on their hands because it's not just gas prices, it's everything else. It's food, uh, it's uh, energy in general for heating your house. Um, you know, everything goes up as a result of gas prices. But I, I will say this before I go into this article. Here's a question. During COVID, we had a quarantine and they were like, oh, yeah, well, if everybody just quarantines for a little while, we can flatten the curb and all that. Well, here's my thing. If gas prices are where they are right now, why don't you get people to say, OK, you know what we'll do? Um, the businesses that can be done remotely We'll do those remotely. People won't have to drive back and forth. And uh, everybody else, if you can, will give you mass transit and you use mass transit or something. Like that could help flatten the gas curve a little. I think that could reduce the demand for at least a week or two, right? But uh, ultimately, this government is too stupid to even think of shit like that. So at any event, it says the market looks scary. What should investors do now? Now, I did start off this video by reading off uh, all of the crypto money that's been lost. It's just evaporated. But the one thing I can say is that most of the people who invested in that bullshit were younger people. The beautiful thing about being a younger person is you actually have time to learn from your mistakes and you have time to make more money. The best time to lose money is probably when you're younger because, again, you have some time to, to learn from your mistakes and to say, you know what, I'm not going to do nothing stupid like that again. And then you move on, you make more money, you get a better job, so forth and so on. Now, when you're talking about people who are getting ready to retire, there's a lot of people out there who have nothing prepared for their retirement. I have a pension. I have money saved up. I've got property that I can rent. If I need to rent, I can get people Airbnb. 
and I could have people come in and out of one of my properties and I, I'm set. But there's a lot of people out there who can't retire, you know, and, and I'm seeing every day what retirement looks like when I look at my parents, my father and my mother. My father retired, I believe, right before the pandemic happened. My mother has been retired for years. So I get to look at them and I get to see all the trials and tribulations they go through with healthcare changing, social security changing, and I get to see everything they go through. But the one thing that has been a fixed income for them has been their pension. So as long as you got your pension and you've got some savings, you got some uh, money market savings or this, that, and other, you got some mutual funds saved up, you're good. But the best thing you could possibly have is a house. And I've tried to tell people, I tried so hard. I tried to tell people to buy a house before they went out and bought these fucking luxury cars. But of course, people were so busy out there stunting and shining that a lot of people just ignored that shit. Oh, nah, I got to go out there and get me. A, I got I to gotta go get me that new BMW. I got to go get that, that, new, uh, uh, that new Mercedes. I got to get... I got to go get that new Hellcat. I want to go get a scat pack. Oh, yeah, well, you know what? <laughs> uh, you're probably going to be permanent renters for the rest of your fucking lives. And you're not going to be able to buy a property because for every one of these losers that lo leaves New York who can't afford to stay here, you can bet that there's foreign money buying up the property and making it so that anybody who comes in there is going to be permanent renters for the next 30 or 40 years. Me personally, I'm 40 years old. I don't foresee myself living past like 90 or 80 or something. So the thing about it is all I'm concerned with is making sure that I can retire comfortably up until I die. After that, it's on you, Generation Z, and it's on Generation Z's kids because at this point, it doesn't even matter to me. But uh, at this point, we'll read this little article. It says, it wasn't supposed to be this way. That's the refrain from many investors who are looking at a U.S. stock market SPX 2.9% negative decline so far this year of about 13%. Even worse, the total bond market is down around 9%. That certainly wasn't supposed to happen. After all, when stocks head down, bonds are supposed to rise in value, right? Smoothing the path. And to cap it all off, there's all the news this year. Maybe this time the world really is headed for a cliff or multiple cliffs. Game over, man. Game over. I'm not saying I believe that, but it can seem that way. So what should an investor do? I think there are many, there's two basic choices, really. One, you can commit yourself to reacting to the daily and weekly noise of the market and the news. Then do whatever your friends and the talking heads on television advise. This route is easy. You will have lots of company and you might even derive some short-term comfort from all that camaraderie. Two, you can commit yourself to making and following a long-term plan based on the lessons of history and all the tools available to investors these days. If you choose the first course, I can't help. And if you don't need what's in the rest of this article, the second path isn't always easy, but it's the right one. And I'm here to give you what you need. What's happening now is mild compared with past stock downturns. The S&P 500 lost 37% in 2008. In 2000 through 2002, the successful annual losses were 9.1% and 11.9%. Then, as if investors hadn't been sufficiently punished, 22.1%. The index had double-digit losses in the mid-1970s, and the Dow Jones Industrial... Well, you know what? All of this shit is just fucking padding the article, so I'm just going to kind of skip through some of this. Okay, um... If this had not occurred over the past 50 years, IBM, negative uh, 1.2%, would today be the biggest technology company. You might have cellular phones, but they wouldn't be owned by AT&T, and you would have to lease them. The monopoly phone company wouldn't have any incentive to offer you lower rates. And if that isn't scary enough, Richard Nixon would still be president. No, he wouldn't. He'd be dead. Uh, nevertheless, investors need a blue pen to get through the tough times. Most readers of this article likely have at least a decade of investing ahead of them. If you are among them, I believe you should make a lifetime commitment to owning equities to provide long-term growth. One good choice is a lifetime portfolio filled with 100% 
equities. If you have the patience and faith to let your investments suffer temporarily through downturns and bear markets, everything we know from history suggests equities will continue to bounce back and reach new highs. If that feels too risky, another excellent choice is a lifetime commitment to having half your portfolio in equities and half in fixed income funds. This will give you a smoother ride, but probably lower returns over the very long term. I don't want to bury you right now with numbers to show what has happened in the past with these combinations. You can study the data for yourself, including eight other equity bond variations in this table. Instead, let's walk together through the how-to of doing this. When it came, when I came into business in the 1960s, the conventional wait, the conventional wisdom called for owning about 10 to 20 percent. I'm sorry, 10 to 20 individual stocks that you would hold for life. Companies like General Motors, Ford, IBM and maybe upstarts like Xerox. Some years later, the prevailing recommendation was to own dozens or even hundreds of companies through mutual funds. The gradual advent of index fund made this practical and inexpensive. By the end of the 20th century, the accepted wisdom was that you should own the largest and most successful U.S. companies through the S&P 500 index. If you think about it, this approach makes good sense. You will own small parts of many companies that are being run by people who are working hard to make them successful. Of course, some companies will fail, but others think Microsoft, Apple, and Google will rise spectacularly. I noticed they also put Facebook in there. I honestly don't think Facebook's going to rise spectacularly. I think Facebook may have already reached its peak. And I think Facebook, I believe right now it's under $200. I think it's like under 198 if I'm not mistaken. The thing about it is Facebook, um, thanks to Apple and their privacy uh, systems that they use in apps, even Facebook came out and admitted that Apple and Google have cost them a lot of money with their privacy systems. Facebook, I don't like them. They're anti, how should I say, anti-free speech. But on top of being anti-free speech, they're pro their own bullshit. So me personally, I don't like Facebook. And if Facebook goes to fucking zero tonight and Zuckerberg loses all his money and jumps out a window... Believe me, in the morning, I'll be sipping my coffee and laughing at the television screen. So anyway, as an equity investor, you face two risks. Market risk, the potential or certainty actually of a decline in the overall market. And stock risk, the potential that an individual company will fail. You'll always have market risk, but if you own hundreds or thousands of companies, that second risk is gone. No, the second risk is not gone. The second risk is only reduced. There are companies that even if the company doesn't completely fail, their stock that you own could be reduced in value so much that it feels like the company did fail. So if you own many companies because you buy index funds, that helps to take your mind off the fact that one or two companies may decline in value and go under. But... Um, the problem is then you have to decide, well, what kind of index fund do you want to have? Now, as anybody who's followed me, you know that I created my own index fund to invest in. And I called it Mangoat. So it was Microsoft, Apple, Google, um, oil stocks that pay dividends, um, Amazon, and Tesla. Mangoat. And uh, I kind of added on to that because there were other stocks that I like to invest in on the side, you know, just to put money in each and every single month. But um, for the most part, I, I created my own index. And um, thus far, it's been pretty strong, specifically the energy portions of the stock. Um, I've taken my YouTube income and I've pretty much reinvested that into my stock portfolio so it makes it easy for me to invest monthly. But uh, for the most part, that's what I've done. I, I like the idea of an index fund, but my problem with it is that some indexes, like if you look at Kathy Wood, Kathy Wood has done terrible. I mean, I mean, she's really done horrible. And the only reason why they haven't talked about her like a dog is because she's a woman. And they felt that propping her up, you know, with all this woke nonsense. You know what they say, if you go woke, you go broke. Well, basically, you know, Kathy Wood has done a terrible job. I, I would say that I could have made more money than Kathy Wood just by doing my 
thing about, you know, focusing on oil and lithium mining and such and such. But uh, Kathy Wood did horrible. And her any anything she gambled on as far as, like, crypto was even worse. But that's besides the point. So it says the solution to that was more diversification, the details of which were formulated and taught in the 1990s by academic researchers. I learned of this research in the mid-1990s and began passing the word, invest in small companies as well as large companies, value stocks as well as growth stocks, international stocks as well as those located in the United States. I've recommended this approach for many years and I still believe in it. But further research suggests you would have received very similar returns from a much simpler approach that includes only four U.S. asset classes. And for whatever it's worth, the four fund combo is down only about 4% so far this year. An unusual case in which it's almost exactly the same whether 100% equities or 50%. Obviously, I have no way to know what the future holds. In my view, the right way to deal with this year's market is to make a permanent commitment to those four asset classes for either half or all of your portfolio. That is likely to serve you well through whatever ups and downs lies ahead. Doing this does not require talent. It, does, it doesn't require a college degree or advanced computer skills. It does not require successfully predicting the future in any way. As I mentioned earlier, the main things it requires are faith and patience. You can't buy those traits. You must supply them yourself. With that commitment, many combinations of funds and asset classes can work. I discussed some of these ideas with Daryl and Chris Penderson. You'll find that conversation in a video. Okay, I'm not going to watch your video right now, homie. So the bottom line, the bottom line is that what you really ultimately need to do, especially if you're a younger person and you're just starting out building a portfolio, I've said the best thing you can do is you should focus on companies that are popular, that have been around for a long time, and that create products that you know you want and that other people want. Microsoft, for example, has focused on subscription services of Windows, of Microsoft Office, of Xbox video gaming. So they make a product that people want. They make a product that's very popular, and Microsoft has been around for a pretty long time. Microsoft also pays a dividend, which is even more reason to invest in them, considering they have a solid product, they have a good subscriber base, and they pay a dividend. The same thing goes for Apple. I'm going to buy the new iPhone 14. I have no idea what the iPhone 14 is going to even look like, but I'm still going to buy it because I know I'm going to buy it. When you have that kind of consumer mentality where you have people lined up ready to buy something and they don't even know what you're going to make, that tells you that that's a good company. Not only that, Apple's been around for a while and they pay a dividend. The same thing goes for NVIDIA. NVIDIA makes the best GPUs that there ever have been made. AMD is following behind NVIDIA, but AMD isn't there. NVIDIA is there. AMD also makes CPUs, and both of those are good companies to invest in. It's just that NVIDIA is a bigger company, pays a dividend, and right now they have a dedicated subscriber base and a fan base that's just dedicated to them. Not to mention that they have... Um, video gaming through regular televisions using cloud gaming, which is going to be a big thing within the next five years. A lot of people aren't going to be able to afford to build computers, and they're not going to be able to afford these overpriced consoles. <coughs> so a lot of people are going to end up being able to play video games right through their computer rise television. The television is going to have an app that allows you to connect a controller to it eventually, and you're just going to play it right through your TV. And you're not going to need a console, and you're not going to need a, uh, a, a computer desktop tower. So that's something worth looking forward to. But the way I see it is, again, if you just focus on companies that make good products, that have a good reputation, and that pay you a dividend... If you had a portfolio that was 100% of dividend-paying stocks, you can't go wrong. Now, my investing is going to continue, but for the most part, it's only going to continue for about 10 years. The way I see it, stocks are fun, but real estate is where it is. Real estate gives you 
the best dividend of all. Once you've paid off a mortgage and you decide to rent out that property, especially if you rent it out to somebody who's insured like Airbnb or, or some kind of home sharing company, uh, that kind of dividend is unmistakable. Not to mention that we're facing, as I said, a future of renters. We're facing people who have poor credit who are never going to be able to afford a mortgage. No bank is going to give... Some Some of these people will never, ever, ever be able to get a mortgage. Even if they have cash, they may not have the job history. They may not have the job stability. A lot of these people are going to be permanent renters you will have if you own real estate you will have no shortage of people from which to rent to then on top of that there's always the possibility that you just want to store your value of your money by putting that money into your property paying off that mortgage your money is stored because the government here, America, they ain't not making no more land. China's making land. America's not making no more land. New York City is not making any more land. California is not making any more land. So when you own property and you have that ability to rent out that property, that's an unmistakable dividend that can't be beat. It just can't be beat. So personally, I believe, and you, you don't have to do things my way. You can do it your way. You can keep investing in Shiba Inu and you can keep investing in fucking Ethereum and watching half your money disappear. But uh, you don't have to do it my way. But I just believe that 75% of your assets, your, 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 your portfolio should be real estate. Even if you only own one house, as far as I'm concerned, one house is more than enough. But if you can own two, that's even better. Things are only going to get worse at this point. I believe America has maxed its credit cards out, and I believe America has painted itself into a corner. Um, oddly enough, after seeing the rest of the world, I still do believe that America is the cleanest shirt in the hamper, but you're in the hamper nonetheless. Uh, this country does have wealth, Unfortunately, it also has just as much poverty as it has. It has far more poverty than it has wealth. Not to mention the poverty, but it has, what's even worse, it has an undereducated, poorly educated workforce at this point. You can't get half of these people to do shit. In fact, these people are complaining just about showing up to work. If you go to Dubai or you go to China or you go to Russia, one thing you ain't going to see is you're not going to see people complaining that they actually have to go to work or quitting because they feel that they can quit. Who gave these people the right to simply just say, yeah, I'm just going to throw my hands up. I'm not going to go to work. You know, I don't understand that because it seems to me that with this great resignation, it seems to me that the option for you, if you don't want to work, is that you fucking starve. It seems to me that the option for you, if you don't want to work, is that you fucking die on the street in the cold. But when you're dealing with a welfare state, that kind of doesn't happen, or at least it doesn't happen like it should. Most of these other countries, when people go to these countries, they go there enthusiastic, they come there ready to work. Just like America was back when we had immigrants coming and they would come into the Statue of Liberty, just like you saw in the movie The Godfather 2. It's like people came here ready to work, no welfare checks, no safety net, no hand downs, nothing. They came here ready to work. You go to any of these other countries, you see armies of people from poorer countries coming to these countries. Just like when I was in Maldives. Guy, I, I met a couple of people, mostly from Sri Lanka, India, Bangladesh, and all of them came there to Maldives. And they were lucky just to get to Maldives. But their own country, their countries are so fucking poor until people literally shit on the streets because they don't even have toilets that flush. So I, I look at this great resignation and I just think to myself, who the fuck gave these people the option not to work? But that's just what we live with. And the thing about it is it's coming to an end. 
because this country is basically, again, it's maxed out its credit cards, it's broke. This country has put itself in such a moral hazard that at this point, there's nowhere to go. So there's nobody to get money to. I mean, who are you going to get money from? The Chinese? Biden is actually considering getting rid of those tariffs that Trump put on China that basically spelled the end of his presidency. Because I, I want you all to remember, Trump's economy was doing great. But the moment he fucked with China, what happened? COVID, and then all of a sudden, you're, no, you're not president no more. And, 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 I, and I said that, I know I said it clearly in videos. I said it, I was like, Trump, I don't know what you're doing, but don't fuck with China. The second you fuck with China, you're done. And he, I, I don't even think Trump saw that one coming. I know he didn't see it coming, but the moment he started with China, I was like, yeah, he's done. I was like, he's done. And it was funny because I had to argue with these stupid fucking idiots in the manosphere arguing with me. Oh, yeah, Trump's doing great. His economy's doing great. You must be out of your mind. Ain't no way he's not going to get president election. Man, China pulled some shit on this guy. And the sad thing was I watched the entire thing unfold. China, the media, they, they were all in on it together. And they pulled some shit on this guy that, I, I, I mean, just to watch, it was like watching a star explode. It's like you, all you can do is just sit there with your mouth open and you're like, wow. And I said, the second he fucked with China, I was like, yeah, he's done. I was like, he's done. But that's what it, that's just what it is. That's just what it is. So America ain't getting China to do nothing now. China is probably doing the same thing Russia's doing. China is divesting itself. China's making sure that America can't do any sanctions worthwhile. Even Russia. Russia doesn't give a fuck about American sanctions. Do you think Russia's worried that McDonald's left? Do you think Russia's worried about Starbucks leaving? Do you think Russia's worried about Coca-Cola leaving? First of all, I want you to take a look at a long list of all the countries and companies that have pulled out of Russia. And I want you to find me one that Russia actually needs. Russia is energy rich. Russia only has like 145 million people at most. They'll be fine. They're not worried about a couple of diabetes causing food corporations. McDonald's and Coca-Cola are the reason why Saudi Arabia is seeing increases in diabetes. You think Russia gives a fuck? About a couple of companies that are killing Americans through diabetes? I mean, how many movies have been made about how they're basically poisoning us with sugar and fucking processed food? Super Size Me? Super Size Me Part 2? I mean, you, you guys, man. But you know what? I, you know, my problem is I have to learn to stop arguing with people. I, I just need to let them, you know, like Captain Kirk said, just let them die. You know, because the thing about it is arguing with these people... These people argue with you, they, you know, my thing is, it's like, whatever, you know, just do what you're going to do, because, you know, you're not going to get anywhere, and then you're just going to put blame on everybody else when you don't get there. It's just sad. It's just sad. I tried to warn these people. I tried to say, don't waste your money on crypto. Put your money in oil stocks. Don't waste your money trying to buy these show-off cars. Buy yourself a house. Do they listen? No. No, they don't. But then they're the first people crying. When things turn upside down. It's very strange. It's very, very strange. But that's about all I got. Because, see, I could talk about this for days. But that's all I got right now. So, you know, as usual, comments go in the URL section.